we need God. And just like what Saint, uh, Kent said a while ago, it is by His grace and His favor and His love that we see today. Let us sing, I need you more. Let's continue. 
continue to sing and declare that God is able. Sister Eileen for uh, the, the praise and worship, just amazing, amazing words in that those really it's reminding us of how our God is able, is really able. I hope we believe that. And just reminding us that we need him in all that we do. And I pray that wherever you are, in whatever situation you're in, you are uh, in your studies, just acknowledge that. God is able and you need him more and more. And even in these difficult times, 
we see uh, the numbers in Korea of COVID-19 cases are rising each day. We never thought that it would go beyond 100,000 and now we're living in that reality. I pray that we not be overcome by anxiety, but just to believe that in these difficult times, we need God even more and more. And uh, as we continue praying, let us continue uh, as a church, we continue praying for this world. I've mentioned about the cases just rising and rising, the uncertainty of what is to come. But in those times we pray as a Christians, we are called upon to stand in the gap and pray for this world, pray for peace. We pray for reconciliation among uh, global leaders and, and, and for cooperation in, in in all these difficult uh, situations that we're in, that we may be able to unite as a people. Let's continue praying for uh, SNU, the university. Uh, it's still not yet known whether we're going to return to normal classes uh, next semester. Um, many international students will be coming in. Some of them are still contemplating whether to retain or to, to, to join in online classes. But we pray that in this uh, time, that there be peace here on campus too, that uh, pray for the university leadership that uh, be able to guide and uh, lead the school well. And also as we're preparing for new students to come in as a church, SMUIC, let's prepare ourselves to welcome uh, the new students. And I also want to pray for the church leadership. Let's continue praying for our friends who are with, who have returned. We continue remembering them in prayer. And even when, whenever we have time to just send in a text and remind them of how we are still uh, remembering them and just how we're still praying for them. Um, and then as we are continue praying, uh, Mrs. Kim is going to lead us in congregational prayer. Uh, let's continue praying. Father in Jesus' name, thank you. We worship you, we need you more, God. We are nothing without you, Father. Your loving Father, you are the creator of the universe, omnipotent God, and full of grace and love. Thank you for accepting us as your children. Father, we confess that we are living through miracles every day when we think about our life in this world. We are so grateful for your loving hands that keep your children safe under your wings. But Lord, we confess that we have not lived as the children of God, but disobeyed your will against your glory. Father, we are so weak, always afraid of facing fear, agony, and despair. This is the reason why you sent your son, Jesus Christ, for us to die on the cross and to resurrect after three days. We thank you that even now the Holy Spirit is interceding for us through wordless grounds. During these past two years, we have shrunken so much because of the COVID pandemic, as we have been driven into confusion, not knowing what is going to happen in the future. Lord, we ask that you show your mercy on us and preserve us in your mighty name. We pray that during these difficult times, help us to deepen our knowledge of you as we meditate your word. Listen to the voice of our cry as we pray unto you. Father, we want to walk with you and give glory to you through our prayer and through our everyday life. 
Lord, we pray for the upcoming presidential election for this country. Let the election be fair and let a person who can be trusted by you and by the people be elected as the president. Lord, have mercy on this country. Even though the winter seems long, we know that the spring is around the corner. As we are preparing the new semester, let all the international students in our church share their vision together with the new students. Father, we know that as a foreign students in this country, they are going through many hardships, but we pray that they walk with you, see the things that the world cannot see, and be joyous as they give glory to you in their lives. Father, bless the speaker, Pastor Josh Kim today, as he proclaims your message. Be with us in every part of the worship today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Mrs. Kim, um, for um, praying uh, for us. So uh, this morning we have uh, a special uh, uh, person that the Lord has blessed us to lead us in the, in the word. But before that, we're going to have a Bible reading. Um, so I will read the, the scripture for this morning. And I think it's showing on your screen. So we'll be reading from the New International Version. Uh, we'll be reading from Matthew uh, chapter 19, verse 13 to 15. Then people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But, he, but the disciples rebuked them. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. When he had placed his hands on them, he went on from there. This is the word of God. Okay, I will uh, invite Pastor David to introduce to us uh, the speaker for this morning. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a profound privilege for me to introduce Pastor Josh Kim to all of you. Although I feel kind of sad and sorry for all of you for your first encounter with Pastor Josh is going to be through an online like this through Zoom, not in real person. I've had the privilege of uh, sitting down with him to chat with him, get to know him a little bit about a month ago. Pastor Josh is a, an MDiv student, Master of Divinity student at Torch Trinity a Graduate University in Yangjae, Korea. He comes from down and under Sydney, Australia. You may have seen many animation uh, speaking about down and under and how Aussies live uh, with crocodiles and kangaroos, but uh, he seems more like someone that you would walk and, and run into in streets of Gangnam. And I am told that he's also a third generation Korean Aussie. His parents were born, both born in Australia. Uh, at the church that they were attending. I think God brought them together so that Josh could be born. He grew up in Sydney, just minding his own business. Uh, he's a man with many, many diff different talents and gifts. God has entrusted him with many uh, gifts. But his life was on autopilot until he heard a still small voice from the Lord. He heard that he had to return to Korea. So not knowing the exact or having the blueprint of what his life is going to be, he just came to Korea. He uh, found a job teaching English in all, of, all the places, Tegu, you know, down and under. I think he likes to be down and under. So uh, he taught English and then he heard the second prompting. Uh, nudging uh, from the Lord very specifically that he is to study theological, uh, pursue a, a degree in theology and study for ministry. 
And he conceded and yielded to that call. And so he became a student. So he's a little bit older than normal, you know, MDiv student, but he brings a lot of uh, experience and giftedness. So I asked him, uh, how can I introduce you to our congregation? And he simply said, an Australian born Korean who returned to Korea for the first time to see healing and restoration of Korea once more. Now that that was it. So I had to like come up with a lot of additional information to give you a, at least a little bit of who he is. He's a worship leader. He's a, a very gifted linguist. He speaks Korean fluently and he doesn't have a lot of Aussie accent. I was really surprised. So I haven't had the opportunity to do um, uh, background check on him to make sure that he was a third generation Korean Aussie, but he was introduced to me by a professor at Tr Torch Trinity, so I trust him. And therefore I decided to trust him. Now, the passage that he uh, picked for today's message, Matthew 19, I tell you, when I read that, I said, boy, this message is for me. So. Uh, with that expectancy, I turn this time over to Pastor Josh. So, Pastor Josh, welcome. And let's welcome him, okay? Uh, thank you for that amazing commentary. I didn't realize my life was so amazing. Uh, thank you so much. I, I feel like, uh, yes, you know, when you started giving my introduction, I, I sent to Pastor David, like, one line, because I was like, he wants me to introduce myself, but like, but then I don't want to say too much because I don't want to sound like prideful or like boastful. I don't want to come off a certain way. So I just sent him this one line and then he like gives me this like grandiose introduction. I feel very, uh, very flattered, very, feel very honored. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, for me personally, I, I feel like out of place. I feel like a fish out of the ocean right now to be able to, to speak to SNU students. I, would never have imagined in a thousand years that I would come and uh, have the honor to share the word of God with SNU students. I feel extremely flattered, extremely out of place. I'm so nervous right now. Uh, that's why at the beginning, when you were asking me all these questions, I was kind of giving short answers because my heart is like palpitating. I'm like so nervous right now. Uh, and so I just genuinely want to say thank you so much. Uh, it's an extreme privilege, an extreme honor to come to this congregation and share the word of God with all of you. Uh, before I start, uh, would you mind if I just pray one more time? Yeah, so let me just pray uh, one more time before we start. Yeah. Blessed are you, King and Lord of the universe, you who is so gentle and so kind, who leads us beside still waters. Uh, Father, I am extremely uh, honored to, to share your word. And, uh, who am I that you would put your word in a sinful man like me and allow me to speak to your sons and daughters? So Father, I, I ask that I would decrease and that you would increase. Father, I choose to get out of the way, that you may take center stake, that you may shine, and that they would see you, King Jesus. Uh, Father, I pray they don't need to know me. They don't need to know my words. So, Father, I pray my words will fall flat to the ground, but I pray your words will land on good soil. Would you open their hearts so that your word would go deep into the depths of their very being, and it would bear much fruit in their life and for your kingdom. Would you receive all the glory? For you are worthy. You are worthy. You alone, King Jesus, are worthy. So I give this time, my lips and the meditations of my heart, and I pray be pleasing before your sight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Um, so to give, again, this feels very strange uh, to, to share with you on Zoom and to see with you all on Zoom. Um, it's nice, at least I get to see your face, it's nice. You know, praise the Lord for globalization and technology, like I get to see you all 
like this. Uh, it feels very unfortunate. I wish I could be with you all face to face. Uh, but thank you so much anyway uh, for allowing me to be here. Um, so to share a little bit about uh, myself. So I am, yes, I'm an MDF student. Um, and actually, someone that I study with is here. Uh, Min Jung Chon Do Sanim is here. And so I feel extremely more uh, concerned right now uh, because she goes to torch with me. Um, and so uh, please do not tell the other students that I suck at preaching. Uh, do not, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, please do not share the word that Joshua Kim sucks. No, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, this is my way of diffusing my nervousness, by the way, uh, making a subtle joke. Um, so over this winter, I had the very great opportunity uh, to plan a Korean outreach with college students that were ranging from, from Handong. Uh, so there's a missions community in Handong and also uh, from a worship community that was started by another Torch student in Seosan, which is Chungcheongnamdo, uh, it's just below Seoul. And so we, we gathered uh, these different college students, uh, the youngest actually being, she just graduated high school. So she's 18. She's about to go into Peksok, uh, Peksok University. Um, and so we gathered all these college students um, because we realized that during COVID and in this time, the Korean church has begun to really kind of slow down in a lot of things. And see, God is like still on the move. As I've been here in the Korea for the past four years, I see that in the history of Korea, not once, not once has God ever forsaken this nation. Like if you look at it from like all the turmoils of the war and from like, like, the, like the Japanese colonization, like God in the midst of this nation, this small at the end of the peninsula, like this nation, like really like this small nation, he has been so faithful, like so abundantly faithful to Korea, to the point that a lot of scholars would call Korea the Asian Israel, because so much of the history of the Old Testament of Israel reflects to the history of Korea. Like we have gone through more wars than any other nation in Asia. We have been under threat People have had battles on this nation like nonstop. We have been under terror. Like we were a like a developing nation, not until so long ago. And now we are one of the strongest economic forces in the world. It's like, how does this make sense? Like, how does this make sense? Scholars literally say this does not make sense. Like it does not make sense. Yet through the providence and the faithfulness of God, God builds his church here in Korea. God built up men, like men and women of God, like Pastor Ha Young Jo, like Pastor like Kim Sang Bo, you know, Pastor like Ju Young Gi like rest in peace as he is in heaven now. These like faithful men and women of God who like pioneered in this nation. When we were under threat in Japan and when we were under immense persecution, like in Cheolla Nam Do is famous in the Southern parts of Korea, it is famous as the martyrs like, like kind of graveyard because so many men and women were martyred for the faith during the Japanese like colonization period. And there are famous stories of men and women who refused to bow to all the things that Japan was making, to all their idols. They refused to recant their faith before the Lord. They walked, they were faithful. And so me and a couple of friends, as we see this amazing history of Korea, as we see this amazing faithfulness of God and, and God who has never once forsaken this nation, has loved this nation, has built up the church, sends our missionaries up to about 10 years ago, we were the, the number one nation in the world for sending our missionaries. You know, a lot of people thought that it was America. No, it was Korea. Korea sent out the most missionaries around the world. But now, but now, 
when you look at the state of what has happened to the Korean churches, there was a statistic recently done in 2019, and it asked about the satisfaction of Korean church members. Is how, how satisfied do you feel about being in a Korean church? And less than 10% said they were satisfied. They said that the Korean church was too hypocritical, too money focused, too fame for like oriented. And this is what the Korean Christians are saying about the body of Christ, are saying right now about the state of God's body. And as we had heard this, young men and women uh, who are now entering into this very burdensome but very privileged position of entering into the ministry. And we see this and God is, is pouring out his heart again to the next generation. And we, and we are catching this, me and a couple of friends. And around Korea, young men and women of God are catching that God is not finished. God is not finished with this nation. Still loves, he still cares for the body of Christ. He still cares for what he had started. And so we gathered these college students and said, God is, is still moving. God is still in the midst of this pandemic. He hasn't stopped working. He hasn't stopped moving. Do you want to come and see what God is doing? So we gathered these 14 college students from all around uh, different parts, different campuses. Uh, and we came and for the past two and a half months or so, we had training. Uh, and so at the beginning, uh, we did a, uh, about a month of just, we met every day, Monday to Friday, and we were studying through the books of Acts. And then on Tuesday, Wednesday nights at 10 o'clock, we had teaching and we, we discipled them. Uh, we invited different people to come and speak. And then um, in the first week of February, we had an offline training for four, di four days. And then in just last week, so I just finished last week. And so last week we went out on outreach to Kangwondo, to Busan, and then was one team in Seoul. And so this is kind of the general overview of uh, what we did. Uh, why am I why am I sharing this with you? Um, if you wouldn't mind, I, I was, as I was praying and as I was, was thinking is what words and what do I, can I say to such esteemed and like honored people as yourself? Like what, who am I, this guy from Australia, this guy from Sydney down under, like who am I to come? What could I say? to you, like very educated, very well, like the next leaders of literally the world, the next leaders who are going to lead your nations. And I'm like, Lord, I feel very unqualified right now to say anything to these people. I said, Lord, what could I say? What could I say? And I felt as, as I was praying and as was preparing is tell them to share with them what I'm doing in Korea. And I said, okay. I shall do that, Lord. I shall just tell of what you are doing. I want to share about one student in particular. Um, her name is Chewon. And when she first started this training, uh, this period with us, and what she had actually told me was, she said, like, you know, I don't know if I've ever had a first love in my life. You know, like when you think about middle school, you have your first crush. You have somebody that like, you know, it's like, man, she was so pretty. And I was like head over heels for her. Or you have this guy, it's like, oh man, he was so handsome. But she said, I don't think I've ever had a first love in my life. And how that translated for her was that because of that, she thought that she was an empty robot that couldn't feel emotions. And so for her, the love of God and what Christ did couldn't translate into the very depths of her being. Because to her, love 
was this abstract concept that didn't click to her. And so as we progressed through the training, she understood all of these things and it, it kind of like, just like, oh, like these are good and these are good teachings and it, it makes sense and this is great. And then when we got to the offline training about three weeks ago, we, we lived together for four days. Um, and during this time, all we did was with them, was we prayed with them, we worshiped um, and we did teaching um, and we trained them and we discipled them. And I remember it was on the third night, like it was on the third night. Afterwards, I went and we talked and I prayed for her and I prayed for her. And I remember afterwards, she looked at me and as she was crying, her response to me was, I get it. And I remember like the look in her eyes, like the look in her eyes had completely changed. Everything about her, it was like something clicked in her heart and something clicked in her mind. And she had this innocence. She had this like sincerity. She had this purity in her eyes. Like, Josh, like, like I get it. Like, I actually get it. This king, he died for me. I get it. He loves me. I get it. It's not a foreign concept. It's not something that the church just says. But to me, this means something. And I remember that like projected her in such a way that when she went on outreach and she was part of the Pusan team, and this testimony, it like, like, it like changed my heart. As they were doing evangelism and she came back when we had debrief and she was sharing was that the way that she looked at the people that they were evangelizing to, the children that they got to meet, was that she began to see them so differently. Because the very depth of her heart, the way that she viewed God, the way that she viewed herself in light of that love had completely shifted every part of her. That she sees through the eyes of God and everything for her had shifted. And everything for her had shifted. As I was praying about what to, what, God, what is on your heart today? Father, what is, what is on your heart to say today? The Lord began to lead me to this verse. Um, and it's actually, uh, as I was doing some research, I actually came to find out that Matthew 19, 13, 15 is usually used in children's ministry. It's usually used as an example of like, God loves children. And I was like, Lord, have you given me the complete wrong verse right now? It's like, what, what does this have to do with all for SNU church? When you look at actually the context of Matthew 19 today, if you look at holistically, at the beginning of Matthew 19, we see that there was a large crowd. There was a large crowd, a very large crowd that had begun to follow him. And so Jesus was teaching to these crowds. We don't know exactly what he was teaching, but Jesus was teaching to the crowd. And at that moment, the Pharisees were there and the Pharisees began to challenge Jesus about marriage and about divorce. And so then Jesus begins to explain to them and correct them. And as I was kind of looking at this context and in the flow of Jesus is correcting these Pharisees, there are all these crowds. And then in Matthew 19, 13, children come to him. Children are coming to him. And we also see that it's not just children came by their own volition. It was either their parents or their caretakers had brought these children to Jesus and then we see another third party, which is their disciples, his disciples, who then rebuke the children. It's, How dare you come to Jesus? And then we see this very famous verse. Is, Do not hinder them. Let the children come to me. For such, for such of them is the kingdom of heaven. And as I was kind of looking at the flow of all of how this is panning out, 
I began to see Christ's heart in the midst of this. Jesus, in the very core of why he had come to this earth, he had come with the heart to save though the very ones that he knew. He came to save the very ones that he knew would reject him and revile him. He had one purpose in his mind, is to save us, to save sinners, past, present, and future. But the very ones that he came to save, but the very ones that he had come to save, are the very ones that are challenging him. The Pharisees are the most well-learned, intelligent, educated. Like, you know, they're the Harvard, the Princeton, you know, they're the Ivy League. They are the most intelligent people. But somewhere along the way, but somewhere along the way, they learning about God had begun to delude their own heart. That what they knew about God, that what they knew about Jesus, what they knew about the word of God, the Torah, they thought they were right in their thinking. They thought that they, what they knew, was correct. And as I was reading and I was studying through this, and there's a parallel version in the Gospel of Mark in Mark 10, is you see that there are these two contrasting parties here today. One is the group of the Pharisee and the disciples who think that they know who think that they know what God is about, who think that they know what Christ has come to do, they paint, they, they painted this image in their mind. They painted like, God, this is, this is who God is. To the disciples and to, uh, to the, a lot of the Israelites, they wanted this general who will save them from the Roman Empire. For the Pharisees, it was like, this very twisted image of God that they had. But Jesus, in the midst of this, he contrasted, he contrasted this to children. So that's kind of the context that we're running with today. This is the kind of context that we hear we are running with today. And if you would allow me to amuse me, I would like to paint you a picture of this verse today. So when we see this, we see that there are all these people and Jesus is teaching and there was a Pharisees and then he like corrected the Pharisees. Oh my goodness, you Pharisees, like you don't know anything. And like he corrects them. And then all of a sudden these like expectant, like very excited parents, like grab their kids and it's like, this guy can bless you. We must go to him. Like there's an, ex- like an excitedness to these parents. They wouldn't just bring Jesus for no reason because to the parents, they still knew that he was a rabbi, that he could bring some form of a blessing. So they're like, like, come here, like, come here. If if you've ever seen Korean kids, uh, Korean parents who are like so excited to get their kids to like the top schools of Korea, it's like that. It's like, it's like, we must take my kid to this high school. It's like, they're so excited, so zealous for their child. They want to give them this blessing. They grab their kids and they bring these kids to Jesus. And I want to talk today about the very children. When I read this, I begin to wonder, what were the children thinking? Like, what were the children even doing in that moment? When they were there, what were they even doing? Like, if you can imagine, like, your little child, and you're going, my parents, oh, my goodness, mom and dad wants me to just come here and meet this guy. Like, what for? Like, what for? And you see this guy. And as a child, you're just kind of like, 
Like, who are you? What can you do? Like, who are you? Like, that's what a child would say. Like, let's be very honest. A child would be like, he wouldn't be like, wow, you're Jesus. Like, you did all these miracles. Children are not thinking like that. It's just like, who is this guy? I don't know this guy. Like, what, 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 can, what can this guy do for me? But one of the scholars say, Jesus says in verse 14, but Jesus said, let the children come to me and do not hinder them. Another way of translating this is that the moment that the children were brought to Jesus, the children in their own volition wanted to come to Jesus. They wanted to come near to him. So in this image and in this picture, the parents have brought them. They're looking at this guy. And but for some reason, the kids are fascinated. The children are fascinated. And they're like, come up to him. And they're like, who are you? And they like poke his face. And they touch his hair. And it's like, and they just like being with Jesus. They just like being around him. And in that same way, what I began to think of Jesus, if I know his character, correctly is I would say that Jesus would have begun to play with them. Jesus would have begun to just embrace them, make jokes with them, hang out with them, spend time with them. We live right now in a society, in a Christian world, where in so many ways, especially in the Christian world right now in the 21st century, like we are being pulled in so many different directions. Like to the point that when I got to seminary, like I, like I was like, Lord, I need strength to endure through these three years. And what I mean by that is there is such a pull right now in this world and in such a way where the gospel of Jesus Christ, the story of his death and resurrection is not enough to people anymore. Like we live in a postmodern world right now where we are being so pulled in so many directions. Churches are implementing new systems, trying to battle like, you know, liberal theology, trying to do this and that and that and that and this and that and that to adjust to the culture, to adjust to the times. Like it was so heartbreaking to hear about what was happening at certain seminaries around Korea and how they had decided to go liberal, how they have decided to allow like LGBTQ, like club activities. They have changed their status, their mission status. That the gospel in itself is not enough. That the gospel in itself to people are not. They need the gospel plus A, B, and C. They need Jesus plus A, B, and C. And as I was wrestling with this teaching today, and as I was wrestling with this, it was easy for me to kid myself and say like, oh no, like I am like this child who is so innocent, who is so like, who is so stargazed, just like that student I was sharing, Chewan, eyes I, like wide open. And like, I just wanna be with Jesus and he's enough. And as I was, praying and meditating through this, I had to stop and repent and repent and repent so many times because I saw myself more so in the Pharisee. So much more so in the Pharisee. If I could be honest with you, you know, I heard this when I went uh, going into seminary. Like, I heard that you will be challenged. Your heart will be challenged. People will start acknowledging you 
you know, in Korean, on the Korean side, they call everybody Chongdosanim. So they call everyone pastor. They call everyone just for the fact that you go to seminary. You know, you all of a sudden receive all this esteem, all this honor. It's like, wow, you're a seminary student. Like, you know, Greek, you know, he was like, you all of a sudden your title is like, dum, 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 dum. like you just level up because you go to seminary. And I found myself in my heart being so tainted by my own pride. Realizing time and time again that what I thought, that Christ, that Jesus, his gospel, the first vows and covenants that I made with God when I was 16, A lot of that innocence, that hunger, that lovesick desire, that Jesus, I trust you and you are enough. I trust you and no but in my heart had to become so tainted. And I had to stop throughout the whole of 2021 and come before God and say, Lord, like I am truly a wretched sinner. I am no more different than these Pharisees who thought that they knew something, who thought that they knew something about you because they were well-studied, because they were well-learned, because they had d- done this and that. They knew so much. Lord, I am no different. Lord, I am no different. Lord, I am no different. And as I was thinking about these children, And as I was thinking about these students who I had now had the privilege of discipling for the past two and a half months and walking with them. And if you could, like, I wish I could show you their eyes. Their eyes are like like sparkling, like literally they're like sparkling with like, it's like, oh my goodness, like Jesus, like I will follow Jesus. Like, oh my goodness, I know Jesus. Like just being, just like the thought of even saying, if you just said to them, like, Jesus loves you, they're like, (laughs) Like they just get so giddy that Jesus loves them. There is like this such this innocence and this tangibility for them. And as I was spending this time with them, I had to stop and really question, do I trust Jesus? That's it. Or is it, do I trust Jesus plus all my education and all my, what I've learned at seminary, what I, what all my ministry experiences, all these things. And what I began to, God began to, so in my depths of my heart began to reveal to me was that I had made all of these crutches in my life, these safe holds, these safe holds that if something fails, at least I have my experiences. Okay, at least if seminary fails, at least if my ministry fails, I can fall back on X, Y, and Z. At least I have all of these other things. I have all of these other things. But when I was hearing my college student and hearing what they had to say, and I remember I asked one of the students, and I said, how much do you love Jesus? And she looked at me with these eyes. I will die for him. And I remember it sent like a shiver down my spine because I haven't heard that from a Korean or just anyone in for such a long time. I said, do you understand the cost of what you are saying right now? No, I do. Because Jesus and what he has done for me is enough for me. That is enough for me. And so when I began to look at today's passage today, why did Jesus say, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. 
In another version, in Mark 10, in verse 15, it says, Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Like a child. Like, what does that even mean? I was so fortunate this week. I got to spend some time with my mentor in Gyeongsan. He has four kids. Yes, he's making a football team. Uh, he has four kids. Uh, and one of the kids, his name's Noah, he's five. And as I was spending time with Noah, and Noah out of the blue, like out of nowhere, he just came up to me and said, Uncle Josh. And I'm like, yes. And he's like, Uncle Josh, like, Uncle Josh. And he's like, I'm like, what's up? And he's like, I just want to tell you I missed you. I just want to tell you I love you. And I'm like, well, where did that come from? And he's like, I've just been thinking about you while you were away. I just missed you while you were away. I've just been thinking about you while you were not here. And as I was looking at Noah and his simple, that heart innocence of he just wanted to be with me. I didn't need to do anything for Noah. I didn't need to give anything to Noah. But he simply just liked being with me, spending time with me. I wonder what it felt like for Jesus who came to be and spend time, live among his people. And for them, all of them, to have their own separate agenda before him. They all wanted something from him. They all wanted him to do something for them. Whether it was save them from the Roman Empire, or save their sick, or save, you know, do something. Say, raise my child from the dead. Like, heal my brother, heal my sister. Do something for me. Do something for me. I wonder how much it broke his heart. That he had just come, I just want to be with you. Of course, he had the motive to die and to bear their sins and he was going to die. But I can also imagine the excitement that Christ felt as he was coming down to this very earth to for the first time to live among the people that he created, to be with them, spend time with them. And for so many of them, to have a separate agenda. But then come run along in Matthew 19, there are these children who don't want anything from him, who don't expect anything from him, but are just happy to be with Jesus. Are just so content, are so satisfied with being with Jesus. I don't know how much time I have. And if I've gone over time, I am so sorry. I should have given warnings. Sometimes when I get lost into it, I'm going to finish up. I think I went way too long. So I'm going to, I'll quickly finish up. Um, I get, I'm so sorry. I get lost into it. I'm so sorry. Um, my question for all of us today, and I want to finish by reading. One of my, my, my favorite passages in John 10. And in John 10, verse 1, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens, the shape hears his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name 
and leads them out. And when he has brought out all his own, he goes before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. And in verse 7, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep do not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pastures. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. When we think about Christ, and when we think about he was not like anybody else, he was not like anybody else, he was the only one who would be willing to suffer, to die, to rise again for a people and for a sheep, for a congregation of people. He knew their hearts even while he lived. He knew what was on their hearts. He knew their agenda, yet still he chose to die. Yet still he chose to lay down his life for his sheep. And he says, I know you, I know you by name. My question for all of us today is, as you look upon this Jesus, as you look upon the gospel, as you look upon his heart, like that little child, those little children, is it simply enough? Is he simply enough? Not Jesus plus what you can do for me, my career, my future, X, Y, Z. But no, 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 Jesus, you died. You rose again. Your gospel is life and that is enough for me. I come before you. I don't need anything else. I trust you because this is who you are. I know who you are and that is enough for me. I don't need you to do anything else for me. I don't need you to say anything else for me just for the very fact of who you are is enough for me. I trust you. I will follow you. Is he enough for you today? Is his gospel, the very essence of his gospel, does that satisfy you? As a little child, like these little children, does that stir your heart? Does it get, does it make you butterflies in your stomachs? Oh my goodness, like, Jesus, he died for me. One of the greatest quotes that I ever heard when I first met Jesus was that if the gospel and his death and resurrection does not bring you to tears every day, then you need to reassess the state of your heart. If his gospel, that he died for sinners like us so that we could be with him for eternity, if that does not move your heart, his love does not move our hearts, like the innocence and innocence of a child, to trust him above all other things. Then I invite us, come before the altar of the Lord and search your heart and ask him, Lord, make my heart to seek you and you only, to be satisfied by you and you alone. Let us pray. Father, as we live in this world, uh, our attentions and our affections are, are pulled by so many different things. 
by what we are doing, by what we have in our hands. And living for you with the innocence of a child, with the purity of a child gets tainted. But I pray for all of us, my brothers, my sisters, the professors, Pastor David and myself. I pray that Father, that until we shall meet with you face to face, or until you shall come back to us in glory, that every day we will be satisfied and content by your gospel. That the very person of Jesus Christ would always be enough for us. That the very person of who Christ is will always be enough for us. Father, I bless my brothers and sisters in their journey and in their walk, in all that they do. I pray that you will guard their heart. That in all things, Christ is the center of their life. Whether they eat, drink, or whatever they do, they would do it for your glory. And be so content and satisfied in you. I bless them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.